Baruchim Aboyim. Thank you for coming. What we are going to do tonight is we are going to uh, begin on a little journey into the holiday of Pesach, Passover. And uh, basically we're going to go through the Haggadah, the prayer that is said at the Seder for the first two nights of the holiday. And the truth of the matter is there's a whole lot of information that you're going to hear here that um, most people don't have time to go over. People are generally impatient. But it's interesting to hear and just to go into the holiday and hopefully it'll answer some of the questions that you have, give you a deeper understanding and a greater appreciation for this holiday, which really is the birth of the Jewish nation. It was the going out of Egypt that began the whole process of us becoming Jewish. Uh, it is the only holiday that we celebrate that has a makeup, even though most people today don't do it, but in the time of the temple, if a person for any reason was not able to bring the Paschal offering on the 15th, then the following month, in the month Eeyore, he would be able to make up the Korban Pesach and to celebrate what was called Pesach Sheni. And uh, if you miss Yom Kippur, Sukkot, any of the holidays, that's it. You missed it. But Pesach, God orchestrated that we have the ability to do a makeup for any reason. Even if a person just decided they didn't want to do it, not just because a person was stopped in some way that was unable to do it for whatever reasons. A person just gets in his head for some crazy reason. Still, he can do Pesach Sheni and do a makeup. And part of the concept being that beginnings are so important. Um, many times if I teach a person to do a Haftorah or, or to give a speech, I'll tell them to memorize the first verse, the first sentences that they're going to say. Because if you stumble on the beginning, then the rest is lost. But if you at least take the first step properly, then there is a great chance that you'll be successful, especially once we begin then we know God helps us. So the beginnings are very important, and again, this is why this is the only holiday has a makeup. So before I begin with the Haggadah, which is the, we will call the prayer book that we use for the night of the Seder, and we'll talk about the Seder as well, the question becomes, why do we call the holiday Pesach, Passover? The answer given is by Levi Yitzchak, is that the um, God passed over the houses of the Jews during the, the plague of the Makos Bechorus, of the killing of the firstborn, and saved the nation of Israel. And we praise God. And the Torah calls this the holiday. It's interesting. So we call it Pesach, for that miracle that God saved us. The Torah calls it Chagamatzos, the festival of Matzah, which relates the praise of the nation that they journeyed into the desert without adequate provisions. One has to realize that the plagues in Egypt devastated, totally wiped out all that was edible in Egypt. There was nothing to eat. And even though the Medrus tells us that every Jew left with 90 donkeys of riches, but they didn't have provisions. And one of the things that God praises the Jews for is leaving with only the matzah that they took with them. And miraculously, that matzah lasted for 30 days till the month the spiritual food fell from heaven. It's also very interesting in that the only plague that the Jews needed to be protected from was the plague of the killing of the firstborn when God passed over their houses. With every other plague, the Jews were automatically had, they were not part of the plague. So the first nine plagues were just to prove that there was a God in the world. Because Paro said, who is God that I should listen to him? So the first nine plagues were just to prove that there's a God. They were not punitive. The tenth was. And since the Jews were also idol worshippers, they needed protection from that punishment. And that's why God had to pass over their houses and they had to go through the ritual of putting the blood on their doorpost and the whole idea of their being saved and the, the, the idea of the firstborns, the Jewish firstborns being redeemed. Now, it says, again, Chag HaMatzos, the Torah calls it the festival of matzah. 
because matzahs are an obligation for all of the holiday. And the Korban Pesach, the Paschal offering, was only connected to the first night. And that would be when the people would bring and eat that Paschal offering, which is Pesach. Also, the matzos are a Torahic obligation, even today, whereas the Paschal offering was only an obligation when the temple stood. So calling the holiday Chag HaMatzos, the festival of matzah, makes the holiday eternal. We still do that today. The, um, the Jew speaks of Pesach, Passover, as a reminder of the sacrifice. Also that unfortunately we cannot offer today, based on the Sarah's Manum, so something that we lament. And that's again a remembrance by saying the words. The, it's an established, it's established, in establishing the order of the Seder, the rabbis inserted numerous mystical allusions, hidden secrets, in every different act that we perform, and each one in its proper sequence. Thus, whether it is a rabbinic requirement or an adopted custom, everything must be done as prescribed without variation. We Jews of today can understand the various elements of the Seder, only at a simple level. And we are really not able to comprehend the wealth of the hidden cosmic significance of all the different things we still do. But still, by simply following the instructions of our sages, and with the intent that our actions be in accordance with their knowledge, we can reach a sublimely high level of holiness and sanctity at the Seder. For these depend not so much upon intelligence as upon goodness happiness and purity of heart, based on the uh, how, how have heritage. Now, it, it, you can compare it to taking medicine. When we have a pain in our foot, doctor pre prescribes a certain painkiller, a certain medicine. And if you look at the vial that it comes in and you read the ingredients, number one is you break your teeth just trying to say the words. Very few of us understand what they are and even fewer of us understand what they do. Yet, without our having any knowledge, we take two of them and our foot feels better. It's not to predicate on our knowledge. And so too the rabbis, Chazal, were spiritual doctors, who on a spiritual level were able to put the words together in a mystical form, whether we understand them or not, that on a spiritual level have great power. Now, when the redemption came, the nation of Israel was not able to tarry even for the, an instant. The smallest delay could have led to the ultimate degree of impurity. And this idea, the Yismach Moshe explains, is symbolized in the prohibition of eating, eating even the slightest amount of chametz, something that's leavened, on Pesach. It tells a Jew that even if he has fallen to the bottom, as long as there is a single spark of Judaism, Yiddishkeit, left in him, then God will lift him from the depths of impurity. And just as he has elevated the nation of Israel in an instant from the morass of Egyptian defilement to the glory of purity, of Tahara, based on Seder's secrets. Again, we have to know that the Jews at the giving of the Torah, around the 49th part of the take being taken out of Egypt, around the 49th level of impurity, had they have sunk any lower, they would have been the abyss, the 50th, and they would have been lost forever. They, so to speak, forced God's hand uh, if you will, it's interesting, the Jews who were supposed to be enslaved for 400 years, they left after 210. 210 days is, an, is a premature birth, seven months. So again, they push God's hand. Uh, it's an interesting question, though. We've been in the Galut, we've been in the exile for over 2,000 years, or some, almost 2,000 years. And yet, the Messiah has not come. The question is, why? How were they able in 210 years, and even those 210 years, in the 200 or the 80 years that Yosef was alive, and the Jews were spiritual and on, on a relatively higher plane. So in 130 at best, and even some say less, they were able to free fall so quickly that they reached the 49th level of impurity. And we, in almost 2,000 years, have not reached that point. After all, if we had then God, again, will be forced to redeem us. What's the difference? There's a major difference. 
the Jews that were in Egypt, in reality, were not Jews. They were pseudo-Jewish. Because real Judaism began at Mount Sinai, when the Jews received the Torah from God. And that began Judaism in, in earnest. At this point, they were not able to release the spiritual sparks in the physical world. The only commandment that was given to them to make them somewhat Jewish was a mitzvah, the commandment of circumcision. At Mount Sinai, they took on and were able to accept Judaism in its fullest sense and then be able to elevate all of creation and release the spiritual sparks, the godly sparks within all of creation. So with the difference between them before Mount Sinai and after is that Mount Sinai, they were given a Jewish soul and the Torah. Before then, they did not have a Jewish soul, nor did they have the Torah. So in that regard, it's much like jumping out of a plane and doing a free fall versus jumping out of a plane with a parachute. It's going to take you a whole lot longer to get to the ground with a parachute and a lot safer than taking a free fall. And that's why God had to save them based on that free fall. Now what else is interesting is that out of all the holidays, if you ask the Jew what is the holiday that is kept by most Jews more than any other, I think many people would say Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And the interesting part is, is that Passover is the holiday that is kept by more Jews than any other. They don't necessarily go through the rituals and not eating chametz all the time and whatever. Although I remember a rabbi talking about in the 50s, he lived in Chicago, and Passover would come out many times uh, during the beginning of the baseball season. And there were so many Jews in the, in the uh, bleachers and uh, watching the Cubs that uh, it sounded like termites with all the matzah that was crackling in the, in the uh, bleachers. But anyways, so we call the book that we that we study that that we study that we say had to talk we, that we say the, the the ritual from all the blessings and all of the ritual that we have we call it the Haggadah. Now, why do we call the book the Haggadah? And because of the verse in Bo in the Sedra that says Levinka that when your son will ask you, it says, and then it says when you and you will tell your son on that day. Now, there are four sons, as most of us, many of you know, that are found in the Haggadah. There's the, the wise son, the evil son, the simple son. And there's a son that doesn't know how to ask, a bashful son. And this is said to him. It's in this term of the God, you should tell your child on that day. Now, but why the Haggadah to, to tell? Generally, the terms for saying in Torah, in Hebrew, are either Vayomer or Vayadaber, both mean to say. Now the difference between them is that Daber is a strong term. We have two times when these, that terminology is used. One with the, we say the world was created with ten mamoros, with ten sayings. God said, let there be light, and there was light. There are ten sayings that God made. Those are mamoros, gentle. Then we also know we have the Aserus Adibros, the ten, what we say, commandments, really ten sayings. And those are tough, strong. So Moshe Beno said to the people, as it says in Yisrael, but tagid, it said, the tagid of the Yisrael, and you shall say to the children of Israel, Rashi with the word tagid, Rashi there says tagid is a soft expression. So God tells to be gentle and tell the people the laws. But there's an extra yud, and Rashi there says, the yud alludes to the word gidim. Gidim are sinews. Rashi says, which alludes to a very strong response. So within the same word of tagid, we have both a gentle response and a very strong response within the same word. So why would we need both? Because the son who's not asking could be one out of two sons, one extreme to the other. Either he doesn't care or he's just bashful and doesn't even have enough knowledge to ask. So if he doesn't care, then we're very strong with him. On the other hand, if he doesn't know and he's bashful, then we're very gentle with him. So if we either use the word Vayoma or Vayadabir, it would be one or the other. By calling the book that we use, the Haggadah, it tells us to speak to each child according to his nature, either softly or harshly, whichever may be appropriate, based on a Kliyakar. So we get both sides. 
It's very important. A person who takes one, one road in bringing up children or dealing with people in general will fail miserably. You may be okay with some, or maybe even most, but you're not going to get everyone. Every door has a different combination to it. And a person, especially a teacher, has to be able to find that combination. And some people don't, and they're lousy teachers. The best teacher is a teacher that can find that combination for each child. And it exists. Sometimes it's harder to find. But if you can do that, then you've really accomplished being an educator. In fact, it was a, uh, an essay. I don't remember much from, from college, but there was an essay done by Samuel Johnson. It was called The Educated Man. And the bottom line of it was an educated man can talk to anyone. If you can only talk to intellects, you're not an educated man. You need to be able to bring it down to its lowest level and even deal with people that are simple. It takes much more knowledge to do that. And that becomes the key to deal with each child. And that's why at the Seder we have these four children. To know that within each one of us may exist all of this, and we'll talk about that when we get to that part of the Haggadah. Now, some understood the word Haggadah to mean thanksgiving and praise. A book of praise to God for taking us out of Egypt. Rapsad Yagon translate to this the verse, we got a Levinska in Arabic in this way. Also, the word Haggadah has numerical values, we always deal with numbers, of 17, which is the numerical value of the word Tov, which is good, again, based on the base Mordechai. So, what we're going to start with is, number one, before I get into it, is the, if you know when Pesach comes, you know when all the holidays come, because each holiday you can find in the days of the week that Pesach comes for those seven days. First day of Pesach is the same day as Tisha B'Av. In fact, we'll talk about it later. That's why we have an egg, sign of mourning, which is not part, not listed in the ritual. Second day of Pesach is the same day that Shavuot will come out. Third day of Pesach is the same day Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot will begin. The fourth day of Pesach is the day that Simchas Torah will come out. The fifth day, Yom Kippur. And the sixth day, Purim. In Lag Baomer. So once you know when Pesach is, you know what day the rest of the holidays will fall out. An amazing phenomenon. Now, what we have at the Pesach Seder, at the table, is a Seder plate. We have a Seder plate. On the plate itself, there are six items. And in addition to that, we have three matzahs. So we have the six items, the Seder plate, and three matzot, which are ten. And again, so the Rizal says that the ten items that we just mentioned allude to the ten sfirot, the ten character traits which God took upon himself to create the world. And these ten traits, three of them are intellectual, that are Chabad, Chachma, Bina, and Das, which is intellect, knowledge, uh, intellect, knowledge, and wisdom. And then there are the six emotional traits, Chesed, Gevura, Teferis, Kindness, Severity, and Beauty. Also, some people call it Emes, Truth. And then Netzachod, Yesod, which is uh, Victory, um, Splendor, and Foundation. Those six are masculine. And then the feminine trait of Malchut, which is Kingship. Now, these also correspond to the body. Again, this is a quick overview. It's all Kabbalistic. Of the right hand is chesed, the left hand is gavura, the trunk of the body is teferis, which is beauty. Right leg is netzach, left leg is hod, and the male genitalia is yesod, foundation. Malchut, which is the only feminine trait, is the, is the female genitalia of the womb. A woman is a true giver. She gets a drop of sperm, she gives back a child. This idea of being a giver. Um, we also correspond to seven sadikim, but I don't want to get into more depth in that because that's really not what this lecture is. But it gives you some idea. Now, what's interesting is is that the um, the the seder plate is there are different customs, but according to Kabbalah, if you look at the a seder plate, some you'll see are round with the six items. I mean, both the, the seder plate is always round but for the holders of what's going to go on it of these six items. So the, according to certain, certain customs, it's in a circular order. 
really no beginning and no end. Whereas with the Hasidic approach, based on Kabbalah, what you have is two segels, three dots, and then three dots. You put this like two triangles, put them together, you have a mug and dove it. Again. Now, why a segel? A segel alludes to the word skula, which is a treasure. Again, alluding to the fact of the Jews being a treasure in this whole concept of leaving Egypt. God taking his treasure with him out of Egypt. Now, dealing with the matzah. So the first thing is Chabad, three intellectual traits. Now, the, you have three whole matzahs that are here. And matzah is eaten three times at the Seder. Once by itself, um, again with the hamotzi, with the blessing over bread, which we make on all holidays. Once with the mora, and we make that with a sandwich. And the third time with the afikoman. These are the three times, again, with the three again. Now, there are, the only item that the Torah obligates us to eat on the Seder night is the matzah. Everything else is either rabbinic or as a remembrance. In fact, there are four mitzvot that we, that we follow on the night of Passover today. There are two Torahic, two rabbinic. The two Torahic are matzah and the Haggadah of telling your child on this night. And the two rabbinic are the four cups of wine, which are rabbinic, and also the mor, even though in the time of the temple, when there was Paschal offering, it was Torahic, but today it's rabbinic. It's done as a remembrance. The three matzahs, why do we have three? Three represent, again, just like the segel with the three dots and three and three. The three represents the three forefathers. Also the three measures of flour that Abraham, Abram Ravinu, told his wife Sarah, Sarah, to use for baking matzahs for the three angels that came to visit him when they told him that Sarah would have a son, and that she would give birth to Yitzchak, and then would go on to destroy Sodom. There are three separate shifts that the nation of Israel would offer the Paschal offering in the temple. But what happened is, is that regardless of the amount of people, but they would have three separate shifts that would come in to bring their, their Paschal offerings. And the people would 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 uh, shek, they would slaughter their, their sheep by themselves. And then the blood would be taken and put onto the altar. And there would be a whole production line with priests doing this. And one group, you have to remember, he had the whole nation come up to the temple on Passover, everyone. So a family would have to come up together because everyone was obligated to eat from the Paschal offering as a family. And again, you had many people, sometimes probably as many as 60 people or so could be come together for taking part of it because you only needed it for a kazayas, which would be the size of a volume of, a, of an olive to be fulfill the obligation to be the last thing you ate. Because in addition, there would be a chagiga, a festive offering, which would be a larger ox or cow, whereas the Korban Pesach would be a sheep that was a year or less in age, would be a big animal. So they had three shifts. They would let the first group in. They would all shek to Korban Pesach, Paschal offerings. They would then sprinkle the blood. Then they would take them out. They would hose down the temple. The floor was all a stone floor. And then they'd let the next group in. After them, again, they would hose it down, and then the third group. Regardless of how many people there were, they broke it up into three groups. So this was, again, the concept of three. Also, there are three types of Jews. There's a Kohen, a Levi, and Yisrael. If you take the first letter of Kohen, Levi, and Yisrael, it spells the word Kali. Kali is a vessel. And if you spell it backwards, instead of Kali, it spells the word Yelech to go, that it becomes important that every Jew uh, not only make himself a vessel for sanctity, but also that Yela, he propels himself to greater heights of, of Kedusha, of sanctity, until he reaches the level of complete redemption. And that becomes incumbent upon each one of us, that we never are content, we never stand still, we're called the wandering Jews. A person should never be content with where he's at. A businessman knows this very clearly. 
if a businessman says he's totally content with what he has, then the truth of the matter is, if you're not going forward, you're going backwards. If he's not trying to increase business, he's decreasing business. The world is not like a car. In a car, you have a gear that's parked. Nobody steals the car. It's going to be there when you get back. In a boat, and we know that towers compared to water, Mayan, that when you either have two gears, forward or backwards, if you're not going forward, the truth is the tide will take you backwards. So you always have to, no matter how fast you're going, at least have it in a forward gear or paddle, because otherwise you're going backwards. And in life, it's the same way. A person has to strive to become better. Now, the three types of matzah are part of what we call the korban toda. Korban toda was one of the things, that even without a sin offering, why the temple was originally, or the tabernacle was originally created, given it to the Jews as a gift so that they could thank God. And in the ritual of the korban toda, which had the shortest span of eating, all sacrifices that were eaten were given the most of two days, the day it was brought, that night and the following day, which um, for health reasons was a very good idea. Didn't want to keep meat around much longer. But the korban toda could only be eaten for that day and that night. If anything was left over the next morning, it had to be burnt. So now you have an ox, and together with it there were 40 loaves of bread. 30 which were matzah, and 10 that were chametz. So you gave four to the priest. That left you with 36 and a cow. So what did you do with that? You made a party. And why did you do that? Because the Torah wants you to tell people of the good fortune that you have. We say in the modim every day, no delacha, and thank you, thank you, and I will tell your praise. So the Torah requires the people who are released from prison who have recovered from a sickness, a serious illness, or those who crossed an ocean or a desert. And the Jews who were freed from Egypt experienced every one of these categories. And our three matzos represent the thanksgiving offering, which we owe to God for doing all these mitzvahs for us. Today what we have is the, um, what we call benching gomel, that we do, and we do that with a minion, we thank God out loud, and then the congregation says to us that uh, it should be true and we should go from greater and greater uh, blessings. Uh, time flies. I think what we're going to do is we're going to stop here, and next week we will continue with a few more ideas about, um, you know what, let's just real quickly. Yeah, I have a couple more minutes. Let's just do about chametz and matzah, and then we'll start with the rest of the Seder plate next week. Chametz and matzah are really opposites. Matzah is unpretentious, flat, and plain tasting. Chametz is inflated and tasty, rises. The Torah forbids chametz to be to the extreme on Pesach, since one must eradicate all vestige of the evil inclination and ego, which is symbolized by chametz, which... But which, but which blows up, which rises. By eradicating its dietary manifestation, we weaken its spiritual manifestation as well. However, this brings on the question, why is it chametz, leaven, is permitted during the rest of the year? Furthermore, how is it that chametz is required on Shavuot during the temple service when the two loaves that were brought and also the first fruits. Both fruit makes things rise, and the two breads were actually made with leaven. So why would they brought then? Interesting, during Pesach, the eagle must be completely and unconditionally humbled. This enables us to bring, begin the seven-week process of the Omer, of transforming the ego and harnessing its power for holiness. So chametz, leaven, is therefore permitted after Pesach, and becomes not only that a mitzvah during the temple service of Shavuot. For our ultimate goal is not to subdue our inner animal being, but to gradually transform it so that it too can stand before God face to face, based on an Alter Rebbe. Now the Mechilta says that the Zohar calls matzah the food of healing. It heals the imperfections in our nature. So how can we eat chametz? So how can we actually eat chametz the rest of the year. Why don't we just eat matzah? And the Zohar gives an example of a doctor who prescribes a health-giving medicine to a patient. 
Once it has achieved its purpose, the person can then eat normal diet again. So the treatment only lasts a, a, only lasts a year and has to be repeated annually for best results based on the Elias Ahadagana. Now, Matsu expresses both our poverty and our haste with which redemption came about. The two are interrelated. It was because of our impoverished state spiritually as well as materially that our redemption had to be done in such a hasty fashion based on the inside time. And with that, again, I think we'll stop here. We'll continue with the other seven parts of the Seder plate when we come together next week. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you for coming.